You're listening to the 5-Minute Friday podcast episode of The Aligned Self. This is your host, Daniel Janovi. Okay, 5-Minute Friday, a short and concise podcast episode of The Aligned Self designed to leave you with a question, an idea, a strategy, a tip, a hack in order to give you greater access to your conscious awareness, evolving your conscious awareness, or give you greater mastery over your mind. Now, if you're listening to this uh, Five Minute Friday in real time, you'll understand that this was not released on Friday. Um, There was some issues with the internet, so I (laughs) re-recorded this introduction. Uh, The podcast was ready to go, but I just couldn't get it uploaded. And I don't know about you, but I've also had some other issues with electronics and mechanical things. Uh, My wife says it's, you know, the Mercury retrograde. So it would just end it, I think, on the 22nd. But, you know, the washer went out. The garage door wouldn't shut or open. It got stuck. Um, What else? (laughs) The issues with the pool, software, internet, the power went out. My phone wouldn't charge. You know, all these little things, they they were actually resolved relatively easily, uh, except for the Internet. Uh, So this is going to be released on Sunday. Uh, But I wanted to, I guess, let you know that uh, it was ready to go. It was in the slot, in the pocket, uh, but I couldn't get it uploaded. And as it goes, sometimes with technical issues. But in the end, I I guess it is an introduction, a good introduction to the topic this week. This week's topic is requisite variety, the law of requisite variety. And what does that mean? Well, this term is used in several different, (laughs) well, this term is used in several different disciplines. It comes from biology. It's used in cybernetics and in engineering. Uh, It's actually a foundational principle in neurolinguistic programming. In the way we use it in NLP, it says that the law of requisite variety in a given physical system is the part of the system with the greatest flexibility of of behavior will control the system. This is a presupposition in NLP, one of those things that we presuppose is true in order for the whole model to work. In biology, you could say that the organism or or the species with the greatest flexibility and the the greatest ability to adapt in changing environments is the one that's going to survive. In engineering, if you have a system of different variables, by limiting the variables, you gain greater control over the system, more reliability. The way Abraham Maslow, the American psychologist said, if your only tool is a hammer, pretty soon everything begins to look like a nail. So in relationships, if you have only one response in anger, let's say that it's your only tool, you respond, you go from zero to 60 in, you know, (laughs) 2.6 seconds, then you're going to have some real problems in communicating with loved ones or anyone that disagrees with you. So in parenthood, You know, if you only have one way of responding to frustration with your child, then it could be problematic. Sometimes people or parents don't even address it. So they let their children get away with all kinds of behavior because they don't want to be too manipulative. And then on the other hand, you know, there are some people that are very disciplinarian. And so they don't let their children get away with anything. Both approaches are problematic. And it typically occurs because, uh, Parents just don't have enough tools in their toolbox. Now, if you were a child uh, growing up in a family dynamic where the parents or the disciplinarians uh, did not have a lot of flexibility in their approach, then you probably felt that you got the short end of the stick the majority of the time. You were not understood. You were squelched. Your creativity, your individuality was squashed. And... That's only, the only reason that happens is because there's no owner's manual for parenthood. And predictably, people respond 
to the same way they've responded when they were children, if they haven't incorporated new techniques, new behaviors, new tools. So let's talk about this in the context of coaching. Uh, As a coach, I work with a variety of people and over the years, uh, all kinds of personalities. And if I only had one approach, invariably I would come upon at one point or another resistant clients. And that happens all the time in psychology. Uh, Typically, you know, psychologists, they're only taught one approach. And so when a client comes in and they don't respond the way they think they should, they say, well, you're just being resistant, which very well may be the case. But when, as a coach, as a therapist, uh, you have multiple ways or multiple tools, multiple approaches, uh, then you never encounter a a resistant client. It's usually a resistant therapist or a resistant coach. And so if I could vary my approach to fit your model of the world, then we're going to get some change. We're going to get some shifts in your behavior because I can adapt to you. Over the years, I've learned a variety of tools and a variety of approaches in order to meet my client where they are so I get the greatest amount of leverage, the greatest amount of shifts and change. So as a consequence, at this point in time in my history, there's nobody that I can't assist. There's nobody that I can't work with. Now, there's people I don't want to work with because it's just too frustrating on my part. I'm more selective about working with people that really want to change rather than people think they want to change. Because I've decided that it's a waste of my time to convince you to change or transform for your own benefit. So I need you to come to me already committed that you want to change. Okay, all well and good, you might say, in the context of coaching, for me, uh, how can you use it as a listener? Maybe you're not a coach. Maybe you're not a teacher. I'm sure you're a parent at some point or another. You're, you interact with other people. So you can utilize this in adapt, and You can take a look at how do you respond in anger? Do you only have one way to love? And sometimes it matches and sometimes it mismatches how people like to receive love. And so you may love the other person, but for some reason they don't feel it. They don't get it. It's not the way they like to receive it. When I was uh, younger playing basketball, I'm right-handed. And so I went predominantly to my right, used my right. And so In a very short period of time, the defender knew where I was going to go and was able to stop me rather easily. So I began practicing utilizing my left hand, using, you know, dribbling with my left, shooting with my left, going to the left uh, to the point where I was ambidextrous. I could go right, left, up, and down. And so the defender had a much harder time defending me because I was more unpredictable. Now, I don't know if you follow basketball, but at one point in time, there was this player called Michael Jordan. He's considered to be one of the best that ever played. And one of the reasons why he was so good is because he had so many different tools in his toolbox. He could go to the basket. He could shoot so many different ways that he was almost impossible to stop. If he really wanted to get to the basket, he was going to get to the basket. So what we're really talking about through the law of requisite variety is giving yourself options, creating a lot of flexibility in your approach. If you look back over the last uh, year, 2020, with the pandemic and the shutdown, uh, if you were a business owner and you did not uh, flex your approach or change your approach, change in, in any way how you did business, chances are you did not thrive. It was those businesses that adapted, those people that adapted to the changing circumstances and still carried on, still prevailed. Uh, you know, instead of in-person uh, meetings, you're now doing Zoom. Businesses that had a large infrastructure where people went there to work, they now have a workforce that works primarily from home and commutes, telecommutes. And another way that this might be used in a personal context, and this is just an example, um, when my wife and I go to the movies, 
we don't always like the same movies. So what I'll do is I'll pick five of the movies that I would want to see and, and let her choose from those five. That way, every time we watch a movie, we both want to see. And every now and then there's a movie that only I want to see. And then I take myself to the theater or I wait for it to come out on DVD or stream or whatever. And the same thing goes for restaurant choices. Now, this was more so in the early days of our our, getting, our going out, uh, because now I pretty much know we're pretty much in agreement where we like to eat. But in the early days, you know, I feel like eating this, this, or that. Uh, what do you? What sounds good to you? This concept of requisite variety, uh, mental flexibility, option thinking is also in alignment with the concept that uh, I utilize called form versus essence, which I'll talk about in the next five minute Friday and introduce that. If you, ha you may already know about it because I have talked about it in past, um, past podcasts, but I'll go into a little more depth about form versus essence. But this whole idea about requisite variety is generating and practicing flexibility in your approach using creative thinking. And you may not think that you're all that creative because a lot of people think that creativity has to do with drawing or painting or some kind of artistic. Well, that's true. That's all, not all it is. It's basically being flexible and considering multiple ideas, looking at it from different perspectives and just how many different uh, ways of getting somewhere can you generate? Once upon a time when I used to drive to a workplace, I generated five different places that I could drive there. Uh, I generated five different paths or routes that I could take to get to work. Also five to get home, depending on if I wanted to take a long leisurely drive home, if I wanted to go home directly, if I wanted to stop by a restaurant first. So I had multiple choices at any given time. All right, so I've given you several different uh, examples and approaches uh, to use this or different uh, contexts on how this might apply. Uh, let's just say that as we leave this with you, that the person with the greatest amount of flexibility is in control of the situation, is in control of their life. This idea has ramifications into everything, the level of your happiness, because life doesn't show up a particular way. Sometimes it's uh, a little crazy. And so it's in your ability to adapt, your ability to be flexible in your approach, to give up your ex or let go of your expectations and just say, okay, that's not working. What do we do now? What's possible? And that's one of the questions that I ask people to utilize when things don't turn out the way you want. What does this now make possible? How does this serve me? Okay, this is, I went over again. I, I'm over, I'm over 12 minutes here. Uh, so I love you. This is your five minute Friday, five to 10 minute Friday. And this is Daniel Dano V urging you to follow your bliss and live the epic life. Mm -hmm.